to start with who are we? Uh, uh, we're, we started in Paducah, but a lot of people in Paducah may not even know who we are. Uh, my name is Dr. Sean McDonald. I'm a, a neurosurgeon by training. But uh, about eight years ago, uh, I joined up with a chiropractor, Dr. Matt Wallace, and we formed this integrated medicine and chiropractic uh, treatment facility that was uh, based on uh, providing treatments uh, uh, based on the philosophy of regenerative uh, medicine, which is the uh, goal to regenerate tissue as opposed to uh, just treat symptoms. Now, uh, before, in, instead of kind of getting into specifically what the opioid crisis is, I'm gonna describe a patient to you that uh, I think sums up what the problem is, what I think the problem is. This is a young man <clears throat> that I saw probably three months ago, 23 years old. Uh, he came to our office. Um, on high doses of uh, a narcotic pain medication, Suboxone. He'd, had, he'd been a uh, motocross uh, uh, rider in his teens and had had a fairly minor injury in terms of uh, the grand scheme of things uh, when he was 16 and uh, was evaluated and treated with opioid pain medications. Uh, he, despite the fact that the pain medication didn't really provide him with, with much pain relief, his underlying condition wasn't treated, uh, he felt he was getting addicted. And he actually approached his doctor and felt that he was addicted to the pain medication and wanted to get off it. So his doctor switched him over to Suboxone, which is another opioid uh, medication that is uh, highly addictive. And he remained on opioid for years, on the, these, on the Suboxone for years. Uh, he'd actually got to the point that he'd stopped working. Um, <clears throat> his relationship with his family was fractured. His father was his best friend and, and became his enemy. Uh, he got to the point that he was actually quite suicidal. And when he came to us, uh, this was his, his last, this was really his last uh, ditch tr effort at trying to uh, get out of pain, number one, and get off the pain medication. And, uh, and we provided him with treatment uh, using regenerative medicine techniques to treat his underlying problem, which was actually quite simple to treat. Uh, and he actually weaned himself off the Suboxone and is actually, his life has changed as a result. Um, and I think that this, this is a very typical case that uh, illustrates the problem that this country faces. So here's a quote from Mark Twain. Now, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect. Now, in healthcare, being on the side of the majority is called standard of care. Um, when I train in Canada, and when I moved to the United States, I noticed uh, that there was a, this was 17, 18 years ago, I noticed that the use of opioid pain medications was far greater than it was in Canada, and it's far greater than it is in Europe, and it's far greater than it is in Asia. In fact, 27% uh, of the overdose deaths in the world are happening in this country, and this is 4% of the population. Um, this is an American problem, this is a Kentucky problem, this is a Paducah problem, uh, and the issue is one that I feel is based on the fact that we, we, we actually feel that the treatment of the pain is more important than the treatment of the underlying condition. Uh, so it, it's really a problem of culture. And it's a problem of, of culture that we as physicians are probably first and foremost to blame. But there's lots of blame to go around. Pharmaceutical co uh, companies, insurance agencies, government, we all share some blame in this. Um, but uh, we believe that there is a solution to the problem. Uh, but it starts with sorting out uh, what is the underlying reason that people are, uh, are, are getting on pain, pain medication. Why do so many people take opioid pain medication? Well, the most common reason that people go to their doctor is for pain. And it's for neck pain, lower back pain, two things that I saw a ton of as a neurosurgeon, and joint pain, mostly knee pain. Now, this is a picture of the spine here. and. Uh, this is just to illustrate that uh, uh, the issue is not so much pain, but what's the cause of that pain? And uh, if we focus in a little bit on the lower back here, you see, you see uh, the spine itself, and there's some red structures which are muscle, and there's some white structures which are ligaments and tendons. And the reason that there's a difference in color there is blood supply. Uh, muscles have a great blood supply. Bones actually have a great blood supply. When you injure a muscle, when you fracture a bone, those things heal. But when you injure ligaments, when you injure tendons, there's not a great blood supply. The factors that are re responsible for healing those tissues are in us, but they just can't get to those areas in adequate supply. So when we injure those, those areas, when we injure ligaments, which are necessary for the stability of a joint, 
uh, there's incomplete or inadequate healing. And over time, this changes the function of the joint and ultimately that results in pain. So it's really a series of issues that end up in pain. And if we're just treating the pain, then we're missing the problem. The other thing is pain is just a message. It's just a messenger. So basically when you're treating pain and you're not treating the underlying problem, you're actually just killing the messenger. And uh, 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 then in, in that situation, you really haven't accomplished anything. So uh, it, it's of utmost importance to underline what the underlying issues are. Now, why do we become addicted to pain medication when we are put on opioids? Uh, how many people in this room have been to their doctor and walked out of the office with a prescription for pain medication? <laughs> so a fairly significant number of people in the audience here. So uh, when we take a pain medication, it actually has multiple effects on our body and our brain, our central nervous system. The primary reason we take the pain medication is to treat pain, and it is effective at doing that. But unfortunately, it has some other effects as well. And one of those areas that it works on is in the limbic system. And that's a part of our brain that's responsible for uh, a lot of emotional type stuff. But opioids in particular can have an effect in causing euphoria, uh, contentment, relaxation. And these are the things that tend to take us from taking a pain medication for pain relief to being addicted to a pain medication. And uh, though that becomes the reward. That becomes what we see. That's, it's not so much the pain relief, it's the contentment, the euphoria, the relaxation, things that, that just makes you feel good. The other area that the opioids affects are, are, are in the brainstem, so uh, breathing control. And this is where opioid deaths become such a big issue because uh, uh, opioids in, uh, in high dosages can actually stop breathing, and that's what causes uh, the overdose deaths. <clears throat> so. Once we get addicted, why is it such a problem? Why, why do so many people end up dying? Well, uh, this is a pretty uh, significant uh, statistic here. And I think Dr. Chang mentioned this when he was here earlier in March. About 80% of new heroin users started out with a legitimate prescription for pain medication. And that's pretty scary. And uh, part of the problem is that uh, some of the solutions that we have come up with in government, uh, House Bill 1, for instance, it's, uh, it, it restricts uh, people's, uh, 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 a doctor's ability to prescribe the medication. So the supply for these patients that are already addicted becomes uh, cut off, and they tend to go to the street, and they uh, tend to turn to things like heroin. And heroin, you don't, just don't know what you're getting. And often, that's what's uh, resulting in, in a lot of the uh, opioid-related deaths. Now, in the bottom right here, <clears throat> We have a little checklist thing here to pick the opioid addict. And uh, the, the point is, is that it can be anyone. And uh, I myself am a recovered uh, opioid addict. I was uh, addicted to opioids a little over 10 years ago. And I was fortunate enough to go through treatment and, uh, and uh, get over that addiction. And I've continued to work on that every day in terms of uh, uh, just uh, the, the principles with respect to treatment, but uh, this is very close to my heart because I feel fortunate that I'm not one of the statistics of the people that actually succumb to this, uh, this terrible uh, disease. Now, as I mentioned, this is a American problem, and in particular, this is a, a Kentucky problem. Um, in eastern Kentucky, about one in three people have family members or uh, have friends who are uh, uh, abusing opioid pain medications, and in this part of the state, it's about one in four. So obviously, uh, this is a significant problem, and there's a lot of people that are looking for a solution. Uh, obviously, government is very interested in, in, in a solution. A lot of, I think, the, uh, uh, the things that have been su suggested as solutions are, uh, are kind of too late in the game. One of the things that Dr. Chang talked about in his uh, a speech to you guys about a month ago was that uh, there are really three areas that you can uh, uh, work on the opioid problem. And one is prevention, one is the treatment of the addiction, and the third is the uh, uh, reduction of harm. And uh, as you go up that scale, cost increases, but you're also behind the eight ball once you're at the treatment stage. Prevention is really the key. And uh, there are some forward-thinking, proactive uh, uh, people in government uh, Andy Bashir and Patrick Morrissey, for instance, uh, gave a talk recently at Marshall University uh, talking about uh, wanting the insurers to promote the uh, non-opioid pain management alternatives when, uh, uh, when viable. 
And uh, that's one of the things that, uh, that we offer at iMac. <clears throat> so in order to accomplish prevention, the number one thing is to identify exactly what one of the problems is. And despite the fact that I'm a surgeon, uh, surgery is one of the gateway problems in terms of this, uh, this epidemic. Uh, in 2016, nearly 3 million patients who underwent surgery became newly persistent users of opioids. Mm. And these aren't patients that are, that it, where I trained, we put patients on Tylenol 3 for a week or two after a major back surgery and then they were off their opioid pain medications. Here that isn't the case. These are patients that are often on opioid pain medications for months while they recover and at that point uh, you're probably dealing with an addiction. Again, in 2016, uh, almost 12 billion pills were prescribed to Americans, and that's uh, enough for every man, woman, and child to have 36 pills each. So just imagine that. That's unbelievable. <clears throat> okay, so uh, is surgery as effective as we say it is <clears throat> as surgeons? When you go to your surgeon and he tells you you need a knee replacement or a back operation, a fusion, is it something that you should consider? Well, in some cases, yes, it is. But is it as effective as we think it is? Knee replacements, do they eliminate pain? Uh, well, uh, uh, one study shows that almost a half, or 47% of the patients a year after surgery for a knee replacement remain on pain medication. Their pain score still rates at about five out of 10, six months after surgery, and almost half have knee pain, either recurrent or persistent two to three years after surgery. Back surgery, that's my area. And, uh, and I can tell you from experience that uh, there's a domino effect when we uh, treat uh, patients with back surgery, particularly the fusions. It's often, they come in, they do a fusion, they do great for a few years, and they come back with another level that's a problematic. So we end up kind of mortgaging our future for this uh, immediate uh, pain relief. But that's not the end of the story. They looked at uh, uh, about 1,500 patients having back surgery. This was a, a study done uh, at the workers, workers' Compensation uh, uh, Board. And about half the patients had a fusion, and half the patients had no surgery. And believe it or not, who returned to work after two years? Uh, only 26% of the patients who had surgery returned to work, whereas 67% who didn't have surgery returned to work. And that kind of blows my mind. I mean, one of the reasons that we're doing the surgery is to try to get people back to work, try to get people out of pain. There was also a 41% increase in opiates in those who had surgery. <clears throat> so what is uh, our solution to the opioid epidemic? This comes back to prevention. Uh, as I mentioned, we haven't uh, prescribed one single opioid in our practice in eight years, not one single opioid. And we're treating, treating the same patients that are going to the pain management, that are going to the orthopedic groups, and not one single opioid has been prescribed. And our, uh, our protocols are built around regenerative medicine, which involves use of stem cells and platelets, and rehabilitation, which is a combination of physical therapy and uh, chiropractic. Let's skip over that. This is just a... So what is regenerative medicine? So uh, we use stem cells and uh, platelet-rich plasma. Now, stem cells are really the heart and soul of uh, what regenerative medicine is. Stem cells are uh, cells that have the potential to become pretty much any tissue in your body. We all have stem cells in us. We have stem cells reside in our bone marrow and our fat. And when those stem cells uh, go to an area where there's damage, for instance, uh, they will divide into a tissue that's signaled by that tissue that's damaged and another stem cell and can continue to divide in that fashion. So they have the potential to regenerate tissue that's been lost in the heart, in the liver, in the brain, in the ligaments. So, for example, with our, our knee protocol, we'll, uh, it, it involves injecting stem cells into the knee. Uh, and these red cells here, these are the damaged cells, and the gray ones would be normal, and the blue are the stem cells. Those damaged cells send signals to the stem cells, which are then attracted to that area, and they divide and start to uh, form new healthy cells as well as more stem cells. As those new healthy cells form and regenerate that tissue, then you can return to normal level of function and a pain-free state. So there, here's just a couple of videos on some patients that I want to show you. Every time I took a step, it was like somebody was sticking me in the side of the knee with a knife. He was bone on bone on both knees. Came in walking with a cane. Now he comes in dancing. The cha-cha. <laughs> with the Delta Knee Program, we were able to take Chad from needing a total knee to an active lifestyle without surgery. The results are 
amazing. You know, you can't fake x-rays. iMac is here to heal you. This is a lady that my neuropathy is bad. I've had to have my veins stripped twice to even keep my feet. I couldn't sit, I couldn't stand, I couldn't hardly talk. I was hurting so bad. And when I came to IMAC, they said, we can help you with this. And I said, heck yes, let's go do it. At IMAC, we use innovative technology to treat neuropathy using regenerative medicine with excellent long-term results. These are people who've had neuropathy for 10 or 20 years, and it's gone. The bottom of my feet don't burn. The pain in them is gone. And I know that there are people out there that would give anything in the world just to be able to stand up. And I would go door to door to tell people, you don't have to sit there. We changed lives at IMAC, and I just love working here. Helping others, that's what they live for. But I'm a miracle, and IMAC offered my life back to me. And that's not an uh, understatement or an overstatement, really. She was on high-dose pain medication and uh, really had a, a miserable quality of life. And uh, 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 until you know what the difference feels like to be on a pain medication chronically and off one, uh, it's, it really is night and day. It's like waking up again, and it's, uh, uh, it, it truly does give people their lives back to get off opioid pain medications. Now, this gentleman is someone that was... Uh, basically uh, on very high dose pain medication, essentially addicted to pain medication. I love my drums. Really when I got injured, I couldn't sit behind them, let alone to actually be able to play. And pretty heartbreaking. That's when my physician put me on the hydrocodones. I recognized the addiction within six months after he was on hydrocodone. I knew this was not gonna be good. I was at that point where I just I didn't want to go on, and my physician said, you can expect to be in a wheelchair within five years. <laughs> he was wrong. He couldn't have been more wrong. With iMac, I found that you don't need medication. They never let me down from the minute I walked in that door. They said, we can help you, Ray. <laughs> and they did. If you need to get off pills and you want a life again, a true life, there is help. Call these people. Call IMAC. So uh, these, are, these are real people. These are people that I've seen, I've treated, I've seen these changes in them. And uh, it's if, you th if you think that you're not susceptible or one of your fam family members isn't susceptible to this, problem then you've got blinders on this is a this is a big problem um, this is I, I I don't think our solution is the only solution there are obviously many levels to this but I think uh, the prevention part uh, uh, basically changing the culture changing the culture in America of of treating pain I mean there's really nothing wrong with pain pain is actually good it's telling you something um, it's really it's really important to, to get on top of this, I believe, and, uh, uh, and, and we want to be part of the solution. I don't want to be part of the problem anymore. I don't think I am. I think I'm part of the solution now, and uh, that's that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone have any thoughts or questions they want to share with Dr. McDonald? Well, I don't have any. Um, hey, Dr. McDonald, can you stay up here questions? for just a second, just in case? I just, um, after hearing uh, from the doctor and um, the also the doctor from University of Kentucky that, that we skyped in, and then uh, uh, Attorney Mark Bryant, I, w I was wondering where we are as far as uh, the litigation part of it. If we, where are we on that? Are we? Do you want to put? Do you want to discuss that during our comments section yeah, while we we're open it. for business? Is that okay? We I'll make a note it. to do that if we you don't do mind. It. Okay. Um, well, I do want to say thank you. I know that Commissioner Wilson was able to make it to your big event that you had recently, and uh, I just want to say congratulations for the growth of your business. And um, sometimes I think the innovation that happens in Paducah goes unnoticed. So we want to make sure that we definitely acknowledge all the work that you guys are putting in to 
hey, anytime we put Paducah on the map, we're proud. So thank Absolutely. you for we that. We appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, I was also um, just want to, with some insight that uh, you, your history. And, thank you uh, so much. If I'm a patient of yours and I'm coming in and I'm, I'm talking to you, uh, you have a different perspective. Absolutely. And uh, that makes a world of difference when you're dealing with a person at their most vulnerable spot. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. Appreciate that.